Are stop and search practices effective at reducing crime? Stop and search is where the police can stop you on the street or in your car as you go about your daily business and they can ask you questions about where you're going, about your name and they can potentially pat you down and search what's in your pockets and in your bag. This is why stop and search generates so much controversy so it's potentially quite intrusive and can make someone feel really undignified. In terms of thinking about whether stop and search practices are effective at reducing crime, we can think about it in two ways. So we can think about the amount of crime and the type of crime. So the number of stop and searches for a start that actually result in an arrest and then a conviction is actually really quite low. Over recent years, only between about 12 and 14% of stops actually led to an arrest. So the impact of stop and search in terms of reducing the amount of crime is quite small. Secondly, if we think about the type of crime, so sometimes people who are stopped and searched are found to be in possession of drugs, but it's unlikely that stop and search disrupts the drug market or drug-related crime through using this tactic. Instead, it's more likely to pick up drug use. So one way in which we might look at whether stop and search is effective in reducing crime is if we look at whether the ends actually justify the means. So if we weigh up advantages and disadvantages of stop and search and think about whether it's actually worth it. So one example to think about is if bad feeling is generated amongst communities who feel unfairly targeted by the police, this might reduce trust and confidence that they have and might mean that they're less likely to report when they've been victims of crime themselves. The police need to be seen to be acting politely, fairly, rationally in order for their behaviour and policing tactics like stop and search to be seen as beneficial. So to return back to your question about whether stop and search is effective against crime, it depends on whether you look at reducing crime from a long-term perspective and also how you interpret effectiveness. So how does racial bias affect stop and search practice? The figures are actually really quite stark in relation to this issue. So if you're a black person, you're at least six to eight times more likely to be stopped and searched by the police in England and Wales as a white person. If you're an Asian person, you're around twice as likely to be stopped and searched as a white person. So it's quite clear that the police are more likely to stop black and Asian minority ethnic group people. But how does racial bias actually affect stop and search practices? The law says that stop and searches should be carried out on the basis of reasonable suspicion, i.e. whether an officer actually suspects that you're guilty of being involved in an offence. The problem is that whether reasonable suspicion is actually acted on is discretionary, i.e. that it's open to choice. And it's really poorly defined. So you often hear about what reasonable suspicion is not, i.e. things like it cannot be a person's race, their age, their appearance or any previous convictions they might have, but there's less clarity about what it actually is. Reasonable suspicion also is really subjective, so it depends on the arresting officer's opinion. So behaviour that might seem suspicious to you might not seem suspicious to me. And where racial bias comes in is that black and Asian people, based on their skin colour, might be seen as intrinsically or automatically suspicious. These associations between someone's perceived ethnic group and feelings of suspicion towards that group is how racial bias might come into policing. Other ways in which racial bias comes into stop and search practice is where the police perform stop and searches, which neighbourhoods. So areas where there are large numbers of black and Asian people might have large number of stop and searches carried out and this is more likely to target ethnic minority groups. Ethnic minorities are also more likely to live in cities so focusing on stop and searches in cities rather than rural areas might also affect how many minority ethnic groups are stopped and searched. And lastly, there are other markers of race which come into play when we think about stop and search. So things like clothing might result in racial bias because officers might be more likely to stop people who are dressed in tracksuits or in clothes that give signals about a person's religious or cultural background.
So new training for the police to reduce implicit bias. I think that training to reduce implicit bias can be good for getting people like the police to acknowledge biases, but the key is what do we do with that information? I personally worry that simply finding implicit bias lets people off the hook, so it conveys the idea that we're all biased and it's psychologically ingrained, so there's little that we can actually do to dismantle attitudes, and this is the part I don't agree with. So I think once implicit bias is recognised, then practices that actually move us forward, for example, encourage us to engage with our biases, involve ourselves with groups we are biased towards and expose ourselves to people who challenge our biases is the next important step forward. After all, biases are stories that we make up about people before we actually know them and so regular and deeper contact with these groups is a key way to challenge these biases. I think on its own recognising and trying to challenge police implicit bias is not enough and that protective laws do need to be put into place or actually some of the laws already exist so they just need to be implemented. So for example the Equalities Act 2010 requires public bodies to have due regard to eliminate discrimination on the grounds of gender, race, disability and religion. So it might be that we apply these requirements of the Equalities Act to the police and what they do. So in practice this might mean that a police force that's found to be consistently disproportionate in terms of race is actually challenged using the Equalities Act. And in terms of thinking more broadly, I think it might be interesting too to find better measurements of racism. So understanding how black and Asian people actually experience racism in their everyday lives i.e. not being treated well in society, looked upon with fear and suspicion. These micro-interactions, as well as what happens structurally, is really important to unpack. And the last point I'd like to make is that sometimes laws are seen as colour-blind or neutral, but we know from their effects that they're not, so they're unevenly applied to black and minority ethnic groups, so their consequences have a particularly negative effect on racialized groups. So immigration laws, for example, are more likely to be applied to black or Asian migrants than white migrants.